Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. If the words British history comes up in hmm? Hey, why did why did I act surprised? I hit the start button. Um Let's go. Hi. Uh who were the first humans on British shores? It's almost eleven PM. I usually don't record this late, but I'm not tired. And I saw this video and I want to watch it. Let's go. Who were the first humans on British shores? Original link, if top description, British Discord history, stuff. Images of Elizabeth I, Shakespeare, Boudicca, Mary Seacole, the Beatles and the Blitz, you're squinting at a small speck of the history of humanity on these isles. Even if you go back to the Roman invasion of Britain in 43 AD, or even further to the Iron Age or the Bronze Age, you're still only looking at 1% of humankind's story in this land. This is a 900,000-year-old story of ice ages, of glaciers, of hunter-gatherers, of hippos swimming in our rivers, of lions and hyenas and rhinos and woolly mammoths. Of a man discovered a century ago who was once thought to be the oldest Englishman who ever lived. We'll speak to the woman who drilled into his skull to extract his DNA, something she only had one shot at, and find out what her and her team discovered. And if your idea of Britain is of a constantly changing climate, well, you might actually be right about that one. But the weather's not the only thing that's changed frequently, because the story of the first Britons is the story of a species who would come and go many times before calling this land home. of time in the year AD 2010, British National Party leader Nick Griffin, in his controversial appearance on the BBC's Question Time, said, the indigenous people of this island are the English, the Scots, the Welsh and the Irish. We are the Aborigines here. Now, this begged the question, who really are the indigenous peoples of Britain? I'm Nar Sarawiwa and I'm a travel writer. And this is a story that has travel and the movements of peoples at its heart. Movement is something few of us have enjoyed lately. Thanks to the lockdown imposed under the COVID-19 pandemic, people haven't traveled much this year. I miss visiting new places. This is only the fourth time I've ventured outside Greater London in the last 12 months, and I've got very itchy feet. Staying in one place is unnatural, not just to me, but to humanity as a whole. Mobility and movement has been fundamental to us ever since we first left Africa thousands of years ago. Descendants of those Africans spread across the world, settling in places like Britain. Who were those early migrants to these shores? That's a question we've been trying to answer for decades. Guys, when we say from Africa, they it's the, uh, I could be completely wrong, Great Rift Valley, I think, wasn't it? Or... Like, where they found the oldest, I, I don't know what, but where they found, like, the oldest, oldest, oldest human. I, d okay. And it I, okay. ...to these shores. Okay. That's a question we've been trying to answer for decades. And it's a cave not far from where we are now in Cheddar Gorge in Somerset that plays a key part in the story of the first Britons. In 1903, just two years after the death of Queen Victoria, a discovery was made which would change our understanding of who the early Britons were. But it would be over a century before we realized how significant that find would be. We visited the Natural History Museum in London to find out more. My Guys, name is Dr. I can see some people, wonder, I guess, both here and here on these screens, so... If you see me switch, I'm not missing anything. Find out more. My name is Dr. Selena Brace, and I'm an ancient DNA researcher here at the Natural History Museum in London. And this is Cheddar Man. He is Britain's oldest, most complete skeleton, and he resides here at the Natural History Museum on loan from the Longley Estate. He's a pretty iconic character. He was found in a cave in Somerset near a small village called Cheddar. The caves 
in Cheddar Gorge where he was found were actually these kind of Victorian show caves where people would go, much like you would today, to go and see the stalactites and stalagmites of Cheddar Gorge. But in December of 1903, two workmen who were digging a ditch for the caves came across the skeleton of an almost complete young man, which at the time caused quite the media storm. People were already saying, perhaps this is the oldest Englishman. Is he 80,000? Sorry, what what was that? Those that's me, that's just to put that's metal, right? That that's not part of the the bone. That's just to keep them together, right? You you see what I'm looking at, right? complete young man which at the time caused quite the media storm people were already saying perhaps this is the oldest Englishman is he 80,000 years old uh, nobody knew but he created an awful lot of interest what we know now of course is that he was a young man probably in his early 20s when he died we don't know why he died. He has quite a large, significant hole over the top of his right eye. This was possibly uh, an abscess that may have caused his death, or it may have happened after he died. Right. So perhaps there was, was water ask. dripping on his remains in the cave. We don't know. What we do know is that he died around 10,000 years ago. He's been radiocarbon dated. When we uh, look at him, we think that he was probably about five foot or so tall. We know this from the length of his bones. Because he's 10,000 years old, he would have been um, a hunter-gatherer. He lived five in the foot. Mesolithic period. Guys, I'm in frame, right? E, not really. Sorry if I was hidden. Period. He would have been um, a hunter-gatherer. He lived in the Mesolithic period in Britain, which is a time when people were roaming across the land. They were living in portable animal skin tents, took shelters in caves like Cheddar Gorge, but did not stay in one place. They moved around, they moved with the seasons, hunted things like auroch, wild boar, deer. They had what we call a nomadic lifestyle. Cheddar Man certainly wasn't the oldest Englishman or the oldest Briton or even the oldest Homo sapien to live in what's now the British Isles. He wasn't even the oldest inhabitant of the place where he was discovered, Goss Cave, currently closed during the coronavirus pandemic. Remains dating almost five millennia earlier reveal Ice Age humans who practiced cannibalism, possibly for ritualistic purposes. There are signs of teenagers, and in one case, a three-year-old child, who were eaten. They even fashioned cups and bowls from skulls. But Cheddar Man's discovery was significant, and over a hundred years later, a very different kind of media storm would erupt around him. But before we hear... Not to be too, uh, macabre, uh, too gross, but, or too psychotic, but, yeah, that's... But back then, I mean, I suppose they had pottery. I mean, maybe it's it, it's really hard to find. A, am I sounding like a psycho right now? I'm like, it's a pretty good bowl, you know? Okay. So. From skulls. And it's but not Cheddar that... Man's discovery was significant, and over a hundred years later, a very different kind of media storm would erupt around him. But before we hear that story, before we explore what it was about Cheddar Man that was so interesting to Selena and her team at the Natural History Museum, we have to go back to the very beginning. Now, Britain was forged between 620 million and 1 billion years ago. A well, great constant was to come into being and would split over time and Europe. reform into new land masses. Dogger All land. the scattered jigsaw pieces of what is now Britain were formed south of the equator, some parts even further away from Britain as Australia is today. Millions of years would pass before the various segments of Britain would drift across the equator and unite on their journey north. So, like the opposite side? And just under a million years ago, Britain, still connected to continental Europe by a broad land bridge, saw its first visit from our ancestors. In 
May 2013, a storm exposed a layer of rock on a beach in Haysborough in Norfolk that was normally covered by sand. Three months later, sand was covering the layer of rock once more. But in the brief time in between, a group of archaeologists found something that looked distinctly like a series of footprints. We now believe those footprints are around 900,000 years old, and they belonged to early humans. You guys are so lucky for that. Be, like, I believe only people, I, I think we crossed from Asia to North America like 10,000 years ago, something like that, like 10 to 20,000 years ago when we first crossed the, the Ice Age land bridge between modern Russia and Alaska. So we only have 10,000 years possible max that we know of where we can find skeletons. And you guys have many, you know, 10 times that, if not more, in Africa, obviously, even more. But North and South America are just so new to, to humans relative to... I hope I don't... I'm, I'm no... Anyways, anthropologist or whatever, but just it's, a, it's much newer than... You know what I mean. I'm jealous. You have a better now, chance we of... we have no idea which particular species of early humans these were. This is still before the time of Homo sapiens. It's been suggested that they were a branch of our ancient relatives called Homo antecessor, known to have lived in what's now Spain. But as no remains have been found, we just don't know. What we do know is that Britain did not give them a warm welcome. Who do what a what? Who do what? But ancient... This is still before the time of Homo sapiens. It's been suggested that they were a branch of our ancient... Now, we have no idea which particular species of early humans these were. Okay, This sorry. is still before the time of Homo sapiens. Ah. It's been suggested that they were a branch of our ancient relatives called Homo antecessor, oh, known to have lived Neanderthal. in what's now Spain. But as no remains have been found, we just don't know. What we do know is that Britain did not give them a warm welcome. At this time, Britain was a cold, hostile landscape. They'd have to survive harsh, bitter winters in the pine forests and avoid the prowling hyenas. If this sounds like an unappealing place to settle, it was. And whoever these early humans were, they didn't stay. F that, I'm out. Almost half a million years later, we find remains from another early human species, Homo heidelbergensis. A leg bone and two teeth were found in West Sussex. They were a tall, muscular people, but they certainly weren't more brawn than brain. They worked together, skillfully hunting and butchering animals such as deer, horses and rhino. They used hand axes and stone tools with precision. But these people didn't hang around either. In fact, life in prehistoric Britain was about to get even more inhospitable. Prehistoric Britain's climate changed wildly over the millennia. Sometimes it was as hot as the Mediterranean. And at other times, ice ages would sweep over the land and our early ancestors would be forced to leave or be wiped out. The climate at this time was constantly fluctuating. The temperatures were dropping. We had glaciers coming across Britain at different time points. And this means that Britain was uninhabitable by humans for quite large swathes of time. So although there were these earlier humans in Britain, none of them remained. We believe ice ages swept across Britain eight or nine times the harshest occurring 450,000 years ago, when the whole of Northern Europe was under a great sheet of ice. For thousands of years, no humans set foot on this land, but as the climate warmed, our human ancestors returned. And this is where one of our most famous distant relatives enters the picture, the Neanderthals. We often have this perception of the Neanderthals as a group of primitive humans who made grunting noises all the time. But it's so crazy how the Ice Age was just phrased in a way because we're talking about over a million years, well, getting down further towards now, obviously, but how the Ice Age was just a part of this kind of million-year journey of finding skeletons there. It's like, oh, it started, oh, and then after the Ice Age, and we're still talking. That, that's just, I don't know, that just that sounded really cool to me. <laughs> 
We often have this perception of the Neanderthals as a group mm. of primitive humans who made grunting noises all the time. Yeah. But mm. they were actually very smart. And along with the Denisovans from Asia, they're our closest ancient human relatives. In fact, on average, their brains were larger than ours today. They were innovative tool makers, and we have evidence based on bone damage on the remains we found that they hunted large animals such as mammoths at close range. These were people who were strong, intelligent, skilled, and good at communicating with one another. As herds traveled across the land with the changing seasons, the Neanderthals followed. They entered and left Britain many times over a 350,000 year period as temperatures continued to fluctuate. But a big change was on its way. As gigantic frozen lakes thawed, many low-lying lands became flooded, and pretty soon Britain became an island. I mean, this is an awesome video so far. Um, one of the coolest things about humans to me is that we seem to be the only species that I know of uh, that was able to go into very different climates, harsher climates. Like, you know, we, we, we're very hairless as far as mammals go, I feel. And we're kind of built for Africa, I, I think, where the climate is much more, much less harmful to people without having to get furs from animals than outside. But how we were able to go out of our environment that we were kind of built for because of putting on clothing, you know? I, I, that, that, again, is something that is just so, so cool to me to, to think about, that we're, we're not meant to be up here, but we're still here because we hunted, and I'm not saying we only got clothing from animal hides, but that was definitely a giant part of it. And that's, that's really cool. I'm saying cool too much. I need to come up with another word. Jesus. Expand my vocab. Ah. Lions have often been a symbol of Have Britain's you guys might. Hear, heard one of them growl? I, oh my, I'm, okay, I'm pausing too much. Look it up. It's terrifying. It sounds like a, a truck. Lions have often been a symbol of Britain's might, a fearsome emblem pilfered from the heart of Africa. Though the irony is, when you walk past the four Landseer lions in Trafalgar Square, know this, lions once roamed through what is now London. When excavation work was going on in the 19th century, hippopotamus and elephant remains were discovered under Trafalgar Square. Dang it. I've always said many videos <laughs> that like, how can you have a lion as your thing if it's not? And now I'm gonna get berated for that. Jeez. Okay. Wolves you did have wild cats prowled prehistoric London and hippos swam in the Thames. Between the ice ages, Britain could be far warmer than it is today. And many of these great beasts arrived with these warming temperatures now, before Britain Pablo was cut Escobar off from the continent by the formation of the English Channel. Ah, warming geez. temperatures before Britain was cut off from the continent by the formation of the English Channel. During colder periods, other large mammals made Britain home. Woolly mammoth fossils were found under the strand, and remnants of woolly rhinoceroses were uncovered beneath Battersea Power Station. But one species that had not made their way back was the Neanderthals. In fact, there's a period of 120,000 years when we have no evidence whatsoever that humans visited Britain. No remains, no tools, nothing. Of course, that doesn't mean that there isn't evidence out there to be found, but from what we know right now, Britain at this time seems to be a land without humans once more. Guys, isn't a species, div I'm really talking out of my, uh, my butt here, but isn't a species sort of qualified by if you can produce offspring with each other and those offspring can produce offspring? Like, you know how like mules and uh, ligers and a few things that like a lion and a tiger can mate and produce a, a, an offspring, but that offspring will be infertile, right? So. Could, if a Neanderthal, this sounds weird now, it sounds more weird than it did in my head, but it's my question. If Neanderthals are around today and they made it with humans, do you, like, do you think we're close enough that, that that would still be a viable, fertile person? This sounds so much weirder than... It's my question, okay? 
It's a serious question. And, and so if that's the case, would they, you know, would they, what makes them not human? Uh, that's, it sounded better in my head. You get my question. For a time, Britain was reconnected to the continent by a massive right. submerged landmass to the east known as Doggerland. The Neanderthals did eventually return for a time, and not long after that, we finally see the arrival of our branch of humanity, Homo sapiens. So the first and evidence for modern kill. human remains, so Homo sapiens in, uh, in Britain, is around 40,000 years ago, so this is before. Mm -hmm. So the first evidence for modern human remains, so Homo sapiens in, uh, in Britain, is around 40,000 years ago, so this is before the time of Cheddar Man, so this is before the hunter-gatherer Mesolithic people. These are the Paleolithic people. And the remains we find from them are, we have uh, a part of a jawbone that was uh, found in Kent's Cavern in Devon. Um, and then there is a man called the Lady of Paviland, who is in fact a man, uh, that was uh, found in Wales, and that's 33,000 years ago. But the thing with these individuals are, and these people who were coming into Britain, is that they didn't remain there. That's a recurring thing. As the most recent glacial period swept across the land, humanity abandoned Britain. Our ancestors had come and gone many times, but as the climate warmed, humans returned. I wonder if that was just Britain or if that was so this Scandinavia is where something too, different or? occurs. For millennia, humans as hunter-gatherers have been the norm, traveling the land in search of food, never stopping long, never settling. And this is where Cheddar Man comes into our story. It was a big change in human behavior that made Dr. Selena Brace and the team at the Natural History Museum especially interested in Cheddar Man and his people. We were interested in looking at Cheddar Man's DNA in part because it is Cheddar Man. He's an iconic skeleton. He's the most complete uh, human skeleton ever found in Britain. But we were also looking at him as part of a much wider study, looking at many, many different individuals from Britain. <laughs> What's the name of this? Is it Leo Pluto? What's the name of this dinosaur? It's killing me. I definitely know the name. I, I gotta, it's distracting me. I have. <laughs> A study looking at many, many different individuals from Britain at this time point. What we were looking at, well, the questions that we were trying to ask by looking at Cheddar Man's DNA and other hunter gatherers from this time, is we wanted to understand why people in Britain change from being hunter-gatherer into being Neolithic farmers. This is a particular interest to us because it's probably the biggest shift in uh, how people behave in modern human history. It's a really big jump to go from being a hunter-gatherer, roaming the land, uh, not living in any one place, moving around all the time, to then suddenly shifting to being a farmer living in one place, farming the land, domesticating animals, living in a very close community next to each other. The change that this would have involved in their day-to-day -day lives is massive. I, I'm, that, I, it's cool to think about, and I, I think, or I, I, I'd imagine uh, there are a lot of smart people throughout ancient, 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 ancient history, right, who individually were smart and I, I'm sure a lot of their technologies are little different inventions of doing things differently to make it easier were lost probably because of a lack of community around them civilization around them to retain that and then document it and then it can be built upon if it's good and so I'm sure it just took a long time of and had to take the right traction i guess to to have a community that holds on to knowledge and when something someone d finds a better way of doing things and you have the i don't know i guess get the basic survival's need needs down and you can start thinking about different ways 
I guess I sort of think about, imagine might have been part of the process that led to the change to farming and stuff, but again, I, and it, it's I really don't know. quite surprising why this happened. And certainly the mechanism as to how this happened is really quite striking. When people first started farming, we're not even sure it was a particularly good idea. It wasn't necessarily particularly good for their health in the beginning. They've gone from having a very broad diet. They would have been eating sort of various things in the season. This is the cheddar man, a hunter gatherer, to then suddenly just eating cereal crops, things that they could farm, domesticated animals. It's a massive shift, and we really wanted to know why that shift had happened. When Selena and her team sequenced Cheddar Man's DNA, their results would generate headlines. But first, they had to extract the DNA. This was a task Selena had to perform on remains really which had been famous for over a century, and she only had one chance to get it right. Yeah, I wonder why. Couldn't as an ancient DNA specialist, my job is literally to get DNA out of dead stuff. This is quite a specialist job because as soon as any living organism dies, the DNA begins to break down. It breaks down into smaller and smaller fragments. So what this means is we have to work in a very specialized laboratory. So here at the NHM, we have an ancient DNA laboratory. And when we go in there, we have to wear like full body suits, we wear masks, gloves, boots, and this is all to protect this degraded human DNA from our DNA, so my DNA. I don't want to be sequencing me instead of Cheddar Man. So when it first starts with trying to get DNA from a sample... What? Why do his teeth seem a part of his jaw? Did it just fuse over time? Is it like starting to fossilize or something? Uh, is that you know what I'm talking about? Like it, it's almost kind of creepy. But it, they don't even look like teeth. They look like parts of the mandible of the, of the. Jesus, I can't think. Too late, of the jaw. Instead of Cheddar Man. So when it first starts with trying to get DNA from a sample, we have to take the sample, in this case Cheddar Man and Cheddar Man's skull, into the ancient DNA laboratory, um, which was quite a scary day, I have to say. No one really wants to be drilling into an iconic uh, specimen, so yeah, I was a bit worried. But we got him in there, we lay him very carefully into a cabinet, and then my first job is to actually remove a small amount of bone powder. I took a, a, a drill, which is a bit like a dentist's drill, and we drill very, very slowly, very carefully. We don't See, want to generate look... any heat. Um, and I was actually drilling into his inner ear bone. So this is a bone called the petrous bone, which is the densest bone in the human body. And so it's dense, so it protects that very fragile DNA within it. So I take my dentist drill and uh, it's very, very carefully, drill a very small hole about three millimeters in diameter into Cheddar Man's Petrus. This removes the bone powder about 20 milligrams. 20 milligrams is a tiny amount. You can probably fit it just in your, in your fingernail. So a small amount of bone powder. From that bone powder, we then uh, break down everything that isn't the DNA. So we break down the bone and then we wash away all all the other things that are sometimes in a bone sample. We get rid of those and then we have our DNA extract. And from there, we do a load more chemical reactions to prepare that DNA for sequencing. And then we put it on a DNA sequencer and out comes the A's, C's, G's and T's uh, that make up the different fragments of Cheddar Man's DNA. Reminds you of a hilarious loophole I, I, I saw in like a YouTube video or something, I forget, about uh, the Jurassic Park, like how how they got the dinosaur DNA and it's because they found uh, mosquito, ancient mosquitoes from the time who had fed on dinosaur blood and they were stuck in sap and preserved. But how did, how did they also made ancient plants and I mean, you're not going to find mosquitoes sucking on plants to get the DNA. So how, 
How did you get that? Sorry. Okay. So Cheddar Man, as a hunter-gatherer, gave us uh, one of several signals of hunter-gatherer genetic data. And when we compared this to uh, the remains, the DNA from people who were farming in Britain, we see that these two genetic signatures are completely different. So what this means is we can make assessments about uh, how this farming was taken up, because what this means is we have have two different groups of people. In other words, the people who were farmers were a different group of people who moved from the continent into Britain, bringing farming practices with them. So it was not a transition of ideas. It wasn't that the hunter-gatherers, people like Cheddar Man, looked at the idea of farming and started farming. It's more that we see a completely different group of people coming into the UK and beginning farming there. So looking Looking at Cheddar Man's DNA was able to help us answer this much bigger question about how the practice of farming occurred in Britain, but of course it also told us quite a lot about Cheddar Man the individual. We can say that he, for instance, was not able to digest milk as an adult. He would have been lactose intolerant, which in some oh, senses isn't that surprising um, because of course he wasn't a farmer. He wouldn't have been exposed oh, to, right. to dairying and farming practices. But we can also say from his DNA a lot about how Cheddar Man actually looked, his phenotype. And from this we can see that he would have had dark brown, uh, probably slightly curly hair. He had a uh, light blue or gray to green eye color. And of course his skin pigmentation would have been dark or dark brown to black in color. Skin pigmentation would have been crazy that they can tell this dark or dark it's almost freaky it's like oh my god it's should we be doing this color no obviously yeah it's just and like course, oh my god i wonder how accurate it is to, to the basal feature i mean it looks like a pretty good recreation but as far as what they can do with the dna but man pigmentation would have been dark or dark brown to black in color in 1903, Cheddar Man had caused a media storm, and 115 years later, in 2018, he was making headlines again. But for Selena and everyone at the Natural History Museum, were the results really all that surprising? To be honest, uh, we weren't particularly surprised by these findings, uh, mainly because other individuals have been sequenced from this time point. So, for example, there's uh, an individual known as Labrania from northern Spain, That's and great. when scientists looked at his DNA, they also found this kind of slight, what seems odd to our eye today, uh, but a very dark skin pigment. I have a theory, guys. Isn't the reason for lighter skin pigment and adapt an adaptation to the less sunlight leaving out of from moving away further from the equator and doesn't having darker skin tone help in having in dealing with the sun so like if you're in the more towards the equator your skin has to be uh you know, say humans or whatever, honestly. I mean, we're animals, so it's a way to adapt to too much sunlight, worrying about that. And as you travel away, you need to get certain vitamins and things that... So you have the opposite problem. You need to get, like, as much sunlight as you can to stay healthy and whatnot. And so since this was an earlier person, maybe that skin adaptation to more northern climates of having lighter skin being easier to absorb sunlight or something may have not fully changed yet. And so that could explain it. I could be talking out of my butt. Uh, obviously, I'm no expert here. Far from it. But uh, that's my theory. Best, my best guess. Coupled with very light, light blue eyes and color. 
It seems highly likely from the evidence that we've seen from the genetic data from Cheddar Man and other hunter-gatherers across Europe that during this time point, the Mesolithic, so around 10,000 years ago, most of the people in uh, Europe, so in Britain, Germany, Spain, they would have had this combination of a darker skin pigmentation and probably this combination with the lighter eye colour as well. We do see some individuals from higher, more northerly latitudes at this time, from say Scandinavia, who have a lighter skin pigmentation. This is possibly due to uh, an association with UV light. So when you are living nearer to the equator, you need a darker skin pigment. Guys. I'm not right off in right. to actually protect from the damaging rays of the sun. As you go into a more northerly latitude, protection from the sun becomes less important. I did not watch this, all right? I'm too lazy to watch a video twice in a row, honestly. I got that pretty down, okay? And instead, what seems to be more important is your ability to create vitamin D, the same melanin that protects your skin from UV I wonder light, what the eye color also stops you from producing vitamin D, which is something that we all need. And so we tend to think that as time has gone on, there has been a selection, a genetic selection or an evolutionary selection for a lighter skin pigmentation in a more northerly latitude. I'm not gonna lie, guys. I'm sort of proud of myself right there. Okay, give me a win. My family migrated <clears throat> to Britain from Nigeria <clears throat> in the late 90s. Sorry. My family migrated to Britain from Nigeria in the late 1970s when I was a baby. Since then, I've visited more than 60 countries around the world as a traveler and writer. I'm an example of migration that's permanent as well as temporary. During my travels, I've been fascinated by diasporas of all kinds, African, European and Asian cultures transplanted from one part of the world to the next. In terms of ethnic composition, the planet today is very different from a few centuries ago. If a geographer living in the 16th century could see the future, they'd be shocked to find the Caribbean full of Africans rather than native Arawaks or Carib tribes. They'd be surprised to find Australian Aborigines largely displaced by English and Irish people. And they'd wonder why on earth Indians make up a third of the population of Fiji in the Pacific. Such changes would be unsettling to some people and pleasing to others. History tells us that the future will be full of surprises, yet our roots sometimes contain even bigger surprises. So back to the question of Cheddar Man. Who was he and how is he connected to us? Modern Britons are in some senses related to Cheddar Man because we're all humans, we're all from the same species. But would modern humans today, people in Britain today, be directly descended from Cheddar Man? It's fairly unlikely, to be honest, yeah. because, as we've said, we know that there are these population movements, in and changes out in, in population so structure in Britain from this time point. So we already know that people uh, came across from the continent, so farmers migrated into Britain, and we see a genetic replacement then. We've also seen a genetic replacement of people moving into Britain later in time, so during the Bronze Age, uh, the Beaker period, and it's quite likely, to be honest, that that kind of replacement happened again after that so many different types of people have moved into Britain so in that sense we're unlikely to be related to him although what's interesting to know is or I think it's interesting is that um, people and humans in general were actually quite inbred in some senses it really doesn't take uh, very much time that you have to go backwards to find what we call your most recent common ancestor so somebody who's actually related to everybody who's alive today well isn't that same logic say that every single species of life on earth is inbred if the theory of life goes that we all have a common ancestor well then that applies to everything, doesn't it? In fact, mathematicians have worked it out, and it's in the region to like 7,000 to 4,000 years ago. So basically, if you were alive then, you are then related to either everybody who's alive on the planet today, or nobody at all. I think that's really interesting. 
the answer to the question, who are the indigenous people of Britain, can be frustrating, intriguing, fascinating or irrelevant, depending on your point of view. The first people to set foot on what are now the British Isles didn't stay. Neither did the next group, or the next, or the next. Most. I feel like this could be said, this, this you know, about every, every indigenous native people anywhere around the world. Of course, in, in, in an essence, nobody is native to anywhere. And everyone is native, I guess, to Africa or to. But, uh, it, you know, there were, this is a video about Britain, but I mean, this is the case everywhere. Where every, especially now, thousands and thousands of years of hundreds of thousands of years or tens of people moving around, I feel like no one on the earth is a descendant of people where they are thousands of years ago. So people migrate, that's what happens. It's just that right now in this current time on the planet, the people are where they are. And so I think that's a good point. Likely Britons today are not directly related to Cheddar Man or many of the other early human settlers. Over the 900,000 years of human history in the British Isles, humans have only been settled here for the last 11% of that time, since around 10,000 years ago. So next time we wade into discussions about Britain's past, let's remember that this has always been a land of people who come and go. A place where at certain points, humans stayed away from Britain altogether for millennia. And as our climate changes, this time for man-made reasons, perhaps how we look and our choices about where and how we live our lives will evolve once more. There's no way it's not, in my opinion, yeah? Really great video. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube Damn. channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss... Oh, hell yes. Heck yes, sorry. Um, hell's okay to say, right? Um, yeah, I think that's a good point. And uh, about Britain, and I think about anywhere, I think to say anyone is a, is a native of any land is the same as a Briton saying they're a native of Britain or, you know, X, enter X country. Really great video. Awesome. Hope you guys are doing well. Don't worry if not. Emotions are fickle, guys. It'll be good soon. Although... Uh, love y'all. Hope you're all doing well. And I'll catch you guys next time. I'd love to see your comments. If you want to join the Discord, I'd love to have you. Bye, guys.